Well, today is the feast of the presentation of the Lord in the temple, 40 days after his birth. It's also called this feast the purification of Mary. It's also called Candle Mass because on this day, uh, at least in theory, uh, the candles that are used through the rest of the year are blessed. It's also called the Feast of the Meeting because it is the meeting between the baby Jesus and Simeon and Anna, the meeting between Christ and his people. Well, there's a great grace in this feast, like all the ones we've been celebrating over Christmas, so let me just try and put some of it into words, and I'll uh, do what Pope Francis likes to do, as a good Jesuit, uh, and make three points. In the Old Testament reading, we heard how the Lord would one day come to his temple and purify it. He will purify the sons of Levi, that is, the Old Testament priests, and refine them like gold and silver. And then they will make the offering to the Lord as it should be made. The offering of Judah and Jerusalem will then be welcomed by the Lord as in former days, as in the years of old. So, offering, offering. And here today are Mary and Joseph going up to their going up to the temple. Here they are with a pair of turtle doves to offer. Here they are with Jesus to offer. Here is Mary offering her newborn son to God the Father. Her life, her love, her first child, her only child, this child of mysterious grace. She offers him to God and she lets the old man Simeon take him in his arms and she hears Simeon revealing the child's destiny, falling and rising, contradiction and acceptance and the sword is to go through her own heart and she takes all this in and she wonders about it and then she and Joseph go home to Nazareth and their daily life and the child her child grows up before her eyes offering offering well in a way what really happened to Mary today was that her offering was taken up in that of Christ her son and this is what Christ can do for us with him our whole life can become an offering an offering welcomed by the Lord Mary and Joseph they're poor in spirit they're poor materially as well and already they are drawn into the offering that Jesus will make later on the cross and the father accept in the resurrection falling and rising well at mass we present bread and wine and they're the symbol of our life our faith our work our spiritual work our efforts our poor efforts to be pure and in the Mass, Christ accepts them. He makes them his. He makes them a pure offering to his Father and then hands them on as holy, life-giving, nourishing things to others. And that can give a shape, a pattern to our whole life. It can all be a Eucharist. It can all be through him, with him, and in him. Well, just think what a new dimension that opens up. The prophecy is fulfilled. The offering of Judah and Jerusalem, which is us now, will then be welcomed by the Lord as in former days, 
as in the years of old. Our lives can enter into the eternal exchange of love between the Father and the Son in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And all the bits and pieces, the broken uh, fragments, scattered fragments of our lives can come together and be lifted up. You know how a tornado comes, picks up the dust, picks up everything that's lying on the ground and swirls it up. Well, the grace of God, the grace of the Holy Spirit can pick up all the dust, all the bits and pieces of our lives, lift them up and they can find a welcome in the heart of God our whole life a Eucharist. Well, here's the second thought, light. This is really the last feast of Christmas. I mean, we keep saying that, but this one really is. And Christmas is a great deal about light. We remember the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds on Christmas night. The Magi were led to Bethlehem by a luminous star. The word epiphany means light shining out. And today, Simeon calls this little boy a light to enlighten the pagans and the glory of your people Israel. And today is called Candlemas. Today, some of us anyway, held candles and had them blessed. Well, this is another sign of what Christ brings. If we believe in him, he's the light, we can be light. We can, as the prayer said, tread the path of virtue and reach the light that never fails. The path of virtue is the path of light, and the final epiphany is heaven. So today is reassuring, because however in the dark we may feel, however much dark is whirling around in the world, a light has been lit. God has lit a light. He is in the arms of Simeon, this child. And if there's faith in our hearts, he is there as well. So let's hold the candle of faith very tight. We mustn't let anything blow it out. And then the last thing. After offering and light, let's say persevering prayer. After Mary and Joseph, after Jesus, come Simeon and Anna. Old, pious, spirit-filled people. At Christmas, Shepherds saw Jesus, men working a night shift. But the epiphany, wise men saw him. Well, they were the scientists and philosophers of their time. But today, it's the turn of the pious and the devout, two representatives of what the scholars call temple piety. Two people whose lives didn't mean much in a worldly way. They were past all that. Two people just waiting, just waiting for God and his light. Two people who kept praying day after day. So, yes, the Lord certainly meets us in our work, the shepherds. He meets us in our studies, our reflection, the wise men. But he has another meeting place as well. He comes to the temple. He comes to the house of prayer and to the house inside us, each of us, the inner temple, the secret thoughts of our heart. He meets us when we pray. So let's not be ashamed to pray, to go to church, to go to Mass, Sunday after Sunday, and bear that little bit of opprobrium which can go with being a practicing Catholic. Let's keep praying, because the Lord is there as well.